from Eastman, Eastman talking to us about what happens when the cloud comes to you. Hello. Um, hey, I don't suppose we can have the house lights up a tiny little bit. I'd like to be able to see who I'm talking to. Um, hey, so I'm Tom. I've oh, and before we get started, I need to warn you, this is not a keynote. Like, like I'm just happen to be first, so be nice. Um, I've worn a couple of hats over the last few years. I guess, first and foremost, I'm a Python dev, but I've, I've done a lot of time as a sysadmin and a security consultant more recently, and these days I'm kind of back in the DevOpsy, sysadmin y wishy washy wimmy wimmy sort of space. So this is actually kind of just a talk about the project that I've been working on, because it's been fun, and I just wanted to talk about it a little bit. And I got to dive elbow deep into a bunch of interesting technologies in the hope of solving what seemed to me to be a fairly novel problem. So this is basically like one of those annoying war story talks where, hey, I use this weird thing to do this weird thing, and to be honest, I'm crowdsourcing my solution architecture to you guys, so you'll um, tell me what I did wrong after the talk. We probably won't have time for questions during my talk, but I really would love to talk about this with anyone who wants to talk to me about it later. So. So I'm here to talk about the opposite of the cloud. So before we can really do that, um, who wants to shout out what the cloud is? <laughs> well, well spotted. The cloud, the cloud is, that's the joke, right? The cloud is somebody else's computer. It's an old joke at this point, but whether it's, not, whether it's actually funny or not depends on who you're talking to, because they may have been burned by this already. But, but a, 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 simplify, a simplification is using the cloud means that you're running critical parts of your own infrastructure on hardware that isn't under your control. Okay, so what is coordinates? I started working in coordinates a little while back. Uh, if you haven't heard of them, coordinates is a cloud-based data platform for processing and publishing large, complex spatial data sets. Uh, the primary instance of the coordinates platform is a large Python, Django, and other component project living in AWS. So it's a, it's a cloud-based platform. Um, we, are, we do most of our stuff on the cloud. But we also have a presence on client networks. We have systems that run inside client networks that coordinate the publication of large data sets uh, between their internal infrastructure, whatever that might be, and our website. So this is kind of necessary just because of the sheer amount of information that can be involved. You might be publishing a, a a layer to the data set, it might be half a terabyte or a terabyte, you might be updating it once a week. It ends up being quite a lot of data, so being able to streamline that process before it gets pushed upstream is a good idea. I came on board at Coordinates with the goal of building an appliance that would make it easier for both us and our customers uh, to handle this process. So. The goal is for there to be a secure and easy way to link internal resources to cloud-based, um, to the cloud-based data publishing platform. Uh, this is sort of the, for the customers who might not have IT teams and programming teams who uh, have the resource or time or wherewithal to just interface directly with all of our APIs and write all their own stuff. So, you know, geospatial engineers and data scientists are geospatial engineers and data scientists. They're smart people, but they might not have time to play with REST APIs that push terabytes of information around. So. The appliance might link an internal SIS server, for example, where data scientists are publishing their data to two layers that are published in the coordinates platform. Or maybe they use internal ArcGIS uh, software or QGIS or something like that. Similarly, the appliance, uh, the coordinates data gateway, the appliance might be doing the converse, where information is being pulled down from the coordinates cloud to, say, a local PostGIS server, a local Postgres server, or some local data store. Whenever it's updated, maybe they want to always have the latest data on hand on their local database. So this appliance would coordinate that jump as well. So what were the basic requirements for an appliance like this? Um, Something that is basically a machine image ready to be booted and do the job. So something that boots up from an OVA file if you're using VirtualBox or VMware, or an AMI image if it's a cloud image, or what, is the, what do you actually call an OpenStack image, a glance image? Do they have a, do they have a name? A image, cool. 
Yeah, what he said. So a bunch of different images depending on the target, depending on what the customer actually uses for their internal infrastructure or you know, their personal infrastructure, no, you know, their corporate infrastructure. Really, really simple configuration. Again, this is sort of for the customers who have IT but probably don't have time. So as close to single step configuration as possible. Preferably just typing in an activation code that we gave them and then it would just commission from there. Subsequent configuration would all happen via the Cordbox website. You would do all of your configuration up in the nice, easy to use, well designed uh, configuration section of the website, and all of that configuration gets pushed down to the appliance. And finally, it needs to be really simple from a networking side to set up. So simple to make sure it's correctly firewalled off, or simple to make sure that it has the communication channels upstream that it needs. Is this starting to worry people yet? Does this sound familiar? It kind of sounds like an Internet of Things device, doesn't it? Something that runs sort of inside your trusted network that you don't control, that you're not an administrator on, that you have to trust when it's talking upstream, that you configure from a website that you don't control, that's not part of your infrastructure. Uh, yeah, yeah, it, it, people's spidey senses are kind of tingling now, right? This is, this is where we start to go, oh. So maybe I'm stretching the metaphor a little bit just because I like the title of my talk, but if the cloud is running your infrastructure on somebody else's computer, then the opposite of the cloud is letting someone else outsource their infrastructure onto one of your computers behind your firewall that you don't get to touch. So my job for the last uh, seven months now has been to design and invent a way of building something like this so that even the most jaded, perennially angry system administrator, hi, uh, can grudgingly say, oh, well, okay, I guess that'll probably work. We'll, we can boot it up behind our network. Uh, so I might actually be a bit of a glutton for, punish glutton for punishment there. So what is it that Internet of Things devices get wrong that have given them such a poor reputation these days? Anyone want to shout something? Se yeah. Thank you. Yep. Security patches, firmware updates, software updates, they just don't happen, right? Um, people don't update the firmware on their routers. Who here has ever updated the firmware on their home router? Not too bad, not too bad, but there's a lot of... <laughs> you, the, you are an exceptional crowd, I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was, I thought that was kind of... Okay, no, anyway. In, Internet of Things devices forget to treat the network as also. They tend to be kind of sloppy with their HTTPS or send HTTP commands or generally just make some silly design decisions like that. They're difficult to remotely administer or maintain, especially if the consumer gets to maintain them on the inside. So for example, my router at home, just for my, from my ISP, I don't, I don't own that. You know, it's not actually my router, it's theirs. I don't have any control over it and I have to hope that they're keeping it up to date. I bet you they're not. So, how do you actually make something that looks like an Internet of Things device reasonably secure? First of all, make sure that it's not admin admin, right? Who's, whose home router is still admin admin? <laughs> Probably, I wouldn't know. <laughs> okay, so get rid of any kind of credentials that mean anyone can do anything wrong with it right from the start, right? Secondly, reduce its attack surface as much as possible. Make sure that what it's doing is limited and what, make sure that what it can do is limited. Make sure, all of its network make sure all of its network communications are secure, as in both authenticated and inscrutable. So properly encrypted, but also properly making sure that it's not men in the middle, they're talking to the right thing. Make sure that it fails securely. This is actually one of the more interesting problems, I think, where 
I think everyone in here probably knows what I'm talking about by that, but you, you imagine your credit card. You know, PayWave's actually not that bad a protocol. Chip and pin is not that bad a protocol. The little mag stripe thing on your credit card is a terrible protocol. It's terribly insecure. But if your credit card chip and pin doesn't work, you just swipe it, right? Like you, these things fall back on an insecure version. Um, email, you know, SMTP is a really good uh, is a really good example. SMTPS is that the right? SSMTP or whatever it is, that's probably a reasonably good way of transmitting mail around the place, but if that doesn't work, it just falls back on plain text, right? It falls back on SMTP. So a lot of, this, a lot of these things don't necessarily fail in a way that keeps the security uh, working. And then finally, make sure that it's so easy to update that updates just happen. So I got given this kind of spec of sort of how we were going to build this appliance, and I realized pretty quickly that appliance wasn't really the right word for it anymore. There are a lot of appliance-specific Linux distributions that are designed to be booted up on like minimal hardware or little things and do a very small subset of functions. Um, they generally have different priorities than me. They want to cut disk space and image size and sort of reduce memory requirements because maybe they're running on Raspberry Pis or other tiny little things. They pack everything down. But my top priority for this whole project is um, A, to be able to apply security updates, B, to be able to apply security updates, and C, to be able to apply security updates. So the answer seemed really obvious to me, which is that you can't treat your appliance like a thing that's built, released, and then ignored. You have to treat it like what it actually needs to be, which is a tightly orchestrated Linux server itself, right? It is just another server on your infrastructure. I'm, I'm in charge of it. I'm responsible for it. I've got to make sure it gets security updates. I've got to make sure that it's well monitored. It's just happenstance that it's living on someone else's network somewhere else where I probably can't even establish an ingoing TCP connection to it, right? So I went back to the stuff that I knew reasonably well, which is how to run a Linux server. I don't really know how to make a specialized embedded device, but I can run Debian okay. So if you, by using a Linux distribution with a solid community behind it, it, it just kind of made every single kind of sense. I, I have access to the community and to the package repository and their documentation. Uh, distribution provided security updates, applied, you know, I can, I can turn on unattended upgrades and auto reboot and stuff and just make sure that I can keep up with the security updates even if there's a lot of these things. Uh, using Debian as well, you know, thanks to things like DKMS, if I, I can get the latest kernel security update without having to especially recompile and make a special packed down binary of the kernel. Um, because these appliances, right, they have some third party additions to them, like the guest additions for VMware and VirtualBox and stuff like that. So being able to trust the security update process uh, m reduces my terror level significantly. Um, just for a little bit more background, I started this project as a contractor, and I'm now an employee of Coordinates, so it is my fault if it breaks. I can't just like walk away. I actually have to. I actually have to have to do this right. So, a mainstream Linux distribution with minimal customization, so that I can kind of keep it as non-snowflakey as possible, if you know what I mean. And then a strong server orchestration and management framework, something that'll help me keep all of these appliances up to date and reasonably well managed no matter where they are. So here's what I've been building for the last couple months. It's, it's kind of three components or three sort of Git repositories, frankly, on our, on our internal system. Um, a customized Debian virtual machine builder using packer.io. Who's used packer for tools before? Oh, brilliant. So for those who haven't, Packer is essentially a build system for machine images. You start either from a Debian installation ISO, and it'll script the full install, and then you can run shell scripts to do customization, and then it'll pack it down to a machine image like an OVA. And or, and or you can start from a base Ubuntu or Debian or anyone's AMI image on the cloud, boot up one of those, run whatever customizations you need on it, and then pack that down and register it as an Amazon image. So, and the nice thing is that it'll run both of those build backends for the same configuration. So you basically have one project that will build a bootable machine image for all of the platforms that I need it running on because it has a build backend for VirtualBox, a build backend for VMware, for OpenStack, for Amazon. 
uh, a repository which is kind of the orchestration server and all of its various software. Um, who knows what Pando is? I, I got to name my own projects. Who knows what Aspen trees are? You probably, most of you know what a tree, what an Aspen is, it's a kind of tree. It's one of those weird trees that um, shares its root system with the trees around it. And Pando is the world's largest living organism. I think it's in New Mexico or Nevada or somewhere around there. And it's a grove of something like 70,000 Aspen trees that all share one root system. It is one living organism. So it's a metaphor. Um, and that's basically a couple Debian servers and a couple bits of pieces, some components. Um, the orchestration server, which I'll get into in a second, OpenVPN server, which I'll get into in a second, time, ser time um, servers, and you know, all the bits and pieces that you actually need to run your own little autonomous network of appliances. And then finally, this is all controlled by a Django project, which is running a REST interface using Django REST, yeah, sorry, Django REST framework, thank you. I can't believe that, yeah, framework. You'd think that would be easy to remember. Um, which is just a nice little REST API that basically controls the whole system. So I'm using salt stack for command and control. Who's used salt? Who has heard of salt but hasn't used it? Brilliant, okay, so using a strong orchestration framework means that I can keep all the appliances up to date, you know, just treat them as if they were puppetized proper Linux servers that I happen to control that just happen to live somewhere totally different. Salt stack is, sim is one of these orchestration frameworks. It's a ma it's a sort of a master slave or the a master minion server orchestration and management tool. It's like Puppet, it's like Ansible, it's like all these things. Um, quoting from the introduction to Salt page, there's two features of Salt in particular that made it useful for me. First of all, it's a configuration management system capable of maintaining remote nodes in defined states, right? That's Puppet, that's Ansible, that's all the stuff that you're probably used to using. Uh, it has this other trick too, which is it's a distributed remote execution system used to execute commands and query data on remote nodes. So what made Salt really ideal for what I wanted to do is its execution model is the Salt minion lives on the appliance and has a permanent, persistent TCP connection to the server from which it receives commands and gives data. So unlike Ansible, which SSHs into all of your servers, so you actually have to make sure that you can get through whatever firewalls to communicate with the server or I think Ansible Tower pushes or pulls. I don't actually, I actually don't know how Ansible Tower works there, but, um, and Puppet sort of calls out on a regular basis, but you couldn't push an immediate command to it without a little bit more uh, configuration. Salt gave me essentially both orchestration and command and control of my appliances in one piece of software that was written by someone else that I didn't have to worry too much about. So it solved the two most important problems for me, actually being able to send the commands to the appliance so that it does what coordinates wants it to do as part of its product, and it also can serve as my mechanism for making sure it's up to date, making sure it's got the latest versions of all the packages it needs to run, so on and so forth. Configuring all the monitoring, everything. Uh, the internet transport for this was OpenVPN, which to me was actually kind of a new tool. I, I mean, I'm guessing everyone in here has spent years messing around with various kinds of VPNs, and OpenVPN in particular, quite probably. I've only ever used it as a customer before, so this was a learning experience for me. But in order to provide some guarantees around the security of communications between the appliance and the orchestration server, everything that it does is wrapped up in, a single open, in an OpenVPN network. So because of this, we can actually be really strict with the incoming and outgoing firewalls on these appliances. First of all, no incoming TCP or UDP connections at all. It just, except for port 53 for DNS, you know, like it really, really locked down. Basically can't talk to this thing. And pure whitelist only outgoing internet connections as well. All the, the only connections that the appliance can make to the wider internet are TCP port 443 on one server which handles the activation, which I'll get to for in a second and UDP port 1194 for the actual uh, VPN connection. So in practice, the appliance probably has to use a number of internet services because it uses NTP to synchronize its time with the upstream. It has to get package updates from Debian and stuff. So all of that happens controlled by us, mediated through OpenVPN and proxied through my orchestration servers. So the internet doesn't really exist for this appliance even though it uses the internet to establish the link to 
my orchestration servers. So what is the appliance? You know, I, I told you how I built it. It's, it's a, a lightly mangled Debian Jesse VM image with some, with some packages installed on it and a bunch of pretty ugly shell scripts because I'm a Python dev writing bash and that's not as, it's, I'm not very elegant with my bash scripting. Um, it's built using Hacker, which kind of feels like cross-compiling a binary just because I'm running it once and I get you know, five machine images out and two hash uh, values, which are like the AMI image ID and the other image ID and so on and so forth. Um, when you boot it up, you don't get to, if, as a customer, you don't get to SSH into it, you don't get to um, log into it. It boots up into a simple little configuration screen that looks something like this. And you hit the little button that's just like, you know, um, tiny little curses interface that boots up on TTY1. And you enter your activation code. And that's about it. You get to see a little bit about what's going on there. I don't think I have a slide in here, but one of the, one of the key points, one of my key design constraints that I made for myself is I needed this appliance to have a three-step troubleshooting process for the customer, just to keep things simple. Step one of troubleshooting, if anything goes wrong, turn it off and on again, right? Step one of all IT maintenance, have you tried turning it off and on again? Step two, oh, just delete the virtual machine and restart it and type in your activation code again, right? That's step two. Step three, delete the virtual machine, download the latest version from our repository, boot it up, type in the activation code. I, I need to make sure that every possible configuration or fiddly problem that they might encounter is solved by one of those three steps, right? So, just try to keep that as simple as possible. Um, and you've probably noticed that everything that I've talked about so far is just totally generic. It's all just strung together bits and pieces of technology that we all use on a day-to-day -day basis. Nothing in here actually has had anything to do with what Coordinates does. Uh, the actual services that Coordinates runs through these appliances all happens in Docker containers. So the appliance is running Docker and if we actually have a service to synchronize a data layer from a PostGIS local to a cloud up there, um, they would take a button on the coordinates website that says, hey, I want this service running on my appliance. We would distribute that through our private Docker repo down to the thing, it just runs there. So there's a decoupling there, which actually kind of started from when I started working on this, I was a contractor, so I didn't really know how their internal platform worked. So I was designing sort of a generic system from which I could say, okay, now your engineers just have to write a Docker container, you give it these environment variables and they'll do the thing. And make sure that my system pinholes the right holes in the OpenVPN firewall or maybe it needs an incoming connection or depending on the service, right? But the idea was that I could just say to the other coordinates engineers, hey, all you need to do is write a Docker container that does the thing and it just needs to take these environment variables and that's it. Um, except now I'm that guy, so I'm gonna have to do that myself. But that coupling there between the sort of generic deployment of the appliance and the actual business logic, the business benefit that this is actually for is pretty handy. Um, oh, I have things there that I hadn't talked to. Yeah. So the appliance, you know, connects upstream and just waits to be told what to do. So the authentication was one of the parts that I sort of had to fiddle around with the most here and I've ended up rebuilding it a bunch of times trying to make sure that no one could easily, no, no one could hijack another appliance or use someone else's activation code to get their appliance that deploys the configuration to it. So any, any appliance that hasn't been activated with that activation code is completely inert, right? Because the, there's very strict incoming and outgoing IP tables firewalls. The only connections it can make are through a VPN that isn't established until it's been activated. So, when you configure one of these things, you type in your activation code in that cursor screen you saw before. The request is sent over HTTPS to my onboarding server, which checks the activation code against the customer. If it turns out to be legit, then Hakia, which is the Django project that controls this, generates the OpenVPN certificate and it generates the salt certificates. The uh, salt infrastructure kind of works the same as Puppets, where it has its own little CA. So it generates the key pairs for those, delivers them back to the appliance. The appliance puts those in place, starts up OpenVPN, waits for the VPN to be established, fires up salt, and then at that point it's just connected part of the network.
this was, this was kind of a chicken and egg problem that went through a bunch of iterations, because at first I wanted everything to be over the VPN. I just wanted to be really tidy that way. And I realized pretty quickly that that would mean having to basically hardwire the VPN keys onto the image when I first built them, and that just didn't feel safe. I really want to make sure that I have absolute knowledge of which customer is using which VPN and, um, certificate. Um, because that helps me handle the self-destruct. Because one of the nice things about VPN certificates is that you can be really annoying with how long they're allowed to live. So if your VPN certificate only lives, say, one day, then the appliance has to re-authenticate itself every day to pull the new certificate down. If it, for any reason, can't activate, because either the activation code has changed, or we've locked out the customer, or it's having trouble getting onto the network, or, I haven't, or I've changed the configuration but haven't been able to push configuration changes down to the appliance, for whatever reason, if it can't get a new certificate every day, it falls off the network. And once it falls off the network, it's inert again because it, the, the otherwise very strict firewalling means that it can't talk to anyone else and no one else can talk to it. So once again, it's kind of blocked off the network. So failing securely, if I, for whatever reason, can't push security updates or configuration changes to this thing, the same mechanism that possibly means that I have failed to talk to it means that it'll self-destruct in a couple days anyway. So one thing that I'm really going for is to not have the fear of having these things floating around out there that I built that are insecure that I haven't been able to update because I can't reach them. So if I can't reach it, it kills itself. Sorry, bad, bad metaphor, but you get the point is that it, it'll just drop off the network for its own good, and then it's just sort of using up cycles. And these customers, you know, we're not gonna have thousands, that would be nice, but we're not gonna have thousands, so we can just like call them up and go, hey, I think your thing broke. So the keys are rotated on a regular schedule, and that includes the salt keys and the VPN keys. So I gave this talk recently, um, or a variation of it, at uh, my Python user group, and. I went through all of this stuff where most of them aren't sysadmins, so they didn't really know what I was talking about, and then I had to sort of gloss over the, uh, the, the, the actual Django part, but this is the actual Django part, and I'm gonna gloss over it. Um, essentially, just a REST framework that sits there and controls all the rest of it. So it ends up communicating with the, um, with the PKI infrastructure that I'm building. It con communicates with Salt through a thing called Salt API. By the way, Salt is really cool, and Oren Shaw is giving a tutorial on Salt later this week. So by all means, if you're interested in what I'm talking about here, go to that tutorial and yeah, it's a cool system. It's worth learning about. Come to me after the talk and I'll tell you some of the really annoying things about it because none of these systems are perfect, are they? Um, I have to make sure that what I've presented to possibly myself, but more likely the other coordinates engineers is a really simple interface for actually handling all of this thing that I'm building, this weird spider web of appliances and other places. Um, Django REST framework is great because it's a REST framework that has a fully self-documenting HTTP interface as well. It's very discoverable. It also handles auto-generation of schemas like Swagger, and it uses a schema generation of um, their own invention called Core API, which is really nice because it comes with a command line client. So I have a really good test framework for making sure this whole system works, which is I have an auto-discovered command line client that will control the entire network just by typing in commands that interface with the REST framework that I built. I am pretty much out of time, so I've got like maybe two more minutes of slides, so I'll just, um, and yeah, so, the, the basic five functions that the Django project does just mediates everything else. So it has a REST interface that the coordinates engineers will use to interface with this sort of as a microservice. Oh yeah, I was supposed to use the word microservice a bunch in this talk and forgot to. Microservices. Um, exposes the appliance activation API endpoint, which is what I was discussing before about how these appliances get their keys. 
um, exposes the salt pillar data, which is the weird, complicated, and kind of annoying way that you transmit secret data into salt stack. Come to talk to me after this, and I'll explain to you all the ways that pillar is weird and annoying. Um, sends all the execution commands for the actual business functionality to the appliances themselves, and communicates with HashiCorp Vault, which is a really neat piece of software, by the way, and I'd love to talk about it sometime, um, which is a secret-keeping server, which I'm only using because it comes with a built-in PKI interface. You can use it to handle your PKI. Otherwise, I was going to have to write some kind of REST framework that spoke to EZRSA or something like that, which might have been neat, but was a big waste of time. Um, so the whole point of this talk was weird DevOps principles can actually apply to systems way beyond what, be, way beyond the cloud. And it was also to sort of just talk about a string of technologies that I think are really neat that you can get some cool benefit from. And after the talk, please come to me and tell me what I'm doing wrong because I do have to make sure that I get this right. And I think it can be done right. Um, we're going to be out of time for questions now, but thank you so much for your time, and please come and talk to me all week. I'll be around. <laughs>